Okay, um, today we're going to go back, uh, well not back, we're going to continue on our uh, bolted joints and connections. Uh, we're going to look at this guy again uh, from last time. Again, it's not a bolt in here, this is a screw, but we're pretending it's a bolt because I didn't have one that fit in there just right. Um, so we're going to look at that in still and static loading. Uh, next one we'll probably get into fatigue loading. Um, we're going to look at some factors of safety. Um, this idea of preload and how you might go about measuring preload, which is, um, on, there are different ways to do that. We'll look at one in particular um, way to do that. Oh, we'll look at, I'll show you another one, but uh, one in particular where you can calculate something that might help with determining if you actually achieved this preload when you put the bolt in. Um, or, well, tighten the nut down on it. Um, there's a lot of terms in here. So, a lot of little... Uh, subscripts on letters to make things uh, uh, specific to whatever you're talking about. These, let's see, I have them here, but they're also in your book, um, starting on page 427 and 428. Uh, they have the same chart or table uh, that has all of these, um, what these different subscripts mean for the different loads and everything. So you do need to start getting familiar. In general, B is going to refer to the bolt itself. Uh, M is going to refer to the member, so all the stuff being squeezed together in the grip. The In this, in our case, it's the, you know, the blue and the red, and even the washers would be part of that. Um, C is that joint stiffness constant. So it's the, uh, por well, C itself is the portion of the external load that's carried by the bolt. So it's some percent around 20 to 30 percent uh, when you do one minus C that's just the other half or well other part of the uh, lo external load so in that case it'd be what's carried by the members um, in uh, we won't use that one too often today anyway but uh, that's just you might have a whole pattern of bolts and so there's multiple um, this FI that is one thing we'll look at today that's called preload so uh, when you initially tighten down the bolt, or well, a lot of times you're tightening the nut. Um, so when you initially tighten that down, um, you're actually stretching out the bolt. Um, and so you're preloading it. You're putting some initial tension in the bolt. And so that will be an important idea to figure out here in a second. Um, in fact, why don't we look at that, the idea of preload. So the idea of preload is that, uh, let's get him out of the way. As you, so this is external load. So as you increase external load, so this will be external. So as you increase that, start over here at zero. Over here on the y axis, let's put uh, the force in the, well, let's just put force for now. And we'll do two different ones. So, the force in the bolt, uh, well, we need to mark down one other thing, don't we? We need to mark down where is our preload. So preload is going to be some amount of tension that exists in the bolt. So this will also be preload over here. So something like you know, 10 pounds. It'll be way more than that, but some number of pounds or newtons. Um, until the external load exceeds that preload, there's basically no additional load in the bolt. Um, and then as soon as you exceed the preload, then the bolt begins to increase in the amount of force it's experiencing. So this is the axial force in the bolt. And then at the same time, uh, as you... Um, the members, all the all the stuff you're clamping together here, all the stuff you're clamped, um, as that begins, as this external load begins to increase, basically they start to relax a little bit. So they were all compressed together, and then as you start to try and pull them apart, then the first thing that happens is they just relax um, until you get to the preload, and then they're not clamped anymore at uh, past the preload and so they basically don't carry any load so this is joint separation right here um, where you actually have a gap between whatever it was you were trying to squeeze together or clamp together might be a better word for that um, and so this is kind of what's going on with preload 
um, and why you want to obtain some amount of preload um, is you want these things to stay clamped together even under an external load that's trying to separate them. Um, and so this is a simplified diagram of what's going on in there. <coughs> um, obviously, if you clamp too fast, or too not fast, too hard, you put too much torque on the nut here and, and clamp things down too much uh, to achieve a high preload in your bolt, then you're going to damage the surfaces you're clamping. Um, you could even strip these threads off of the bolt uh or if the bolt's down in a hole um that you can strip those threads out or deform them um the bolts themselves have a stress string gap diagram that looks sort of like this uh, so stress strain we got to get over our paper so stress strain diagram you know normal ductile material it's going to have a very large plastic region. Bolt material is more like this. So it does have a little bit of a plastic region, um, but uh, it's not. it approaches more like a brittle material than a ductile material. They've been cold worked a lot, a lot of times for high strength bolts. Um, this may not apply to just a, a little cheap bolt or whatever, but a bolt that you're actually going to put in a machine you design. Uh, it's probably going to be more of a high strength bolt that's going to look more like this um, where obviously this is ultimate strength so a fracture up there um, and then you know somewhere in here it's your yield strength um, and bolts are going to have or bolt materials are going to have uh, what's called the proof strength so we're going to put that down in here so this proof strength is basically a, uh, a fraction of your yield strength um, and that's uh, a number that you can find in a chart somewhere. Um, you can, there is a, a way to calculate it. I think it's like 85% of your yield strength if it's uh, not listed. You know, you don't have a, a grade or a class of bolts that tell you, hey, for this bolt, the proof strength is 650 megapascals. If you don't have that uh, for the material you're dealing with, it's about 85% of your yield strength for whatever material you have. Um, but the idea here is that um, since there's not this super well-defined yield point, um, you're just going to drop down from what the uh, yield for that material is listed as because it, you know, it's, a, it's a range of numbers in reality. Uh, they've aggregated a lot of data and come up with a yield strength average. And so you're going to drop down from there 85% or so. Well, you're going to drop down 15% to 85% of the yield strength. Um, they're not all exactly 85%. Some of them are listed as specific numbers in uh, your textbook. Um, and this is called the proof strength. What you can do with this is um, it's more or less, you know, elastic in this region. Um, and you can determine what your proof load needs to be based on the proof strength. So there's two big ideas with proof load. So proof load is um, the load associated with that proof strength. So the actual axial force. So proof load. Um, and then um, from the proof load, we could find out, um, we go one of two directions for preload. So preload, that's how much force I'm going to generate in the bolt before the bolt is put into service by tightening the nut or however I'm going to tighten the bolt up. Um, normally you're, you're tightening the nut on here, which stretches out that bolt and it establishes some amount of preload, which goes into you know, our little chart here. Um, so this preload, you could think that I never want to take this bolt out again. It's a permanent connection, and um, if I do ever take it apart, I'm not reusing those bolts. So in that case, for permanent, or well, at least not to be reused, 
because you might take it apart sometime. The idea is that you don't reuse these bolts. Then you go, the preload is equal to 90% of the proof load. If, on the other hand, so you're basically running, you know, you're running, as far as the strength goes, you're running right up to almost the proof strength. Um, the other idea is that, well, no, this is something that I want to take apart often and reuse the fasteners. So I don't want to go get new fasteners every time I take this apart. Um, so this is non-permanent or, or something where you do want to reuse. And so you might imagine that it's a smaller number than 90%. So it's 75%. So, so back on our little chart here, you're only going to go up to, you know, 75% of your proof strength. Um, so to calculate this guy, uh, there's an equation. These are all back in page. All this information is around page 4. 27 and 28, I think, in Shigley, uh, at least in the 10th edition. It's, they're usually similar for all the editions near there. Um, so for this guy, the, the proof load, this FP, not the preload, the proof load, is going to equal that proof strength. So the number that you got from a chart or you calculated the 85% of the materials yield strength um, times this AT. Now we used that AT last time in calculating the bolt stiffness, but this is the tensile area of the bolt. So that's a number that you have to go find in a chart with the bolt dimensions in it. So AT is equal to the tensile area of the bolt. So all you're doing there, this is just a straight strength. So a stress equals a force over an area. If you rearrange that, if you're wondering where that's coming from. Um, so with this idea, you can go in and you can figure out exactly how much preload axial force do you want to have in the bolt um, when you're done installing it. Um, <clears throat> so how do you know you actually got that in the bolt? That's the trickier part. This part is actually pretty straightforward. You know, you do a little multiplication, pick out, do you want to multiply by 90 or 75 uh, percent and you have your preload. The trickier part is how do you know you got that preload in here? Well, um, there's a couple of ways. The most accurate way is um, this preload, well, this preload, whatever it comes out to be, uh, is going to cause some amount of axial deformation in the bolt. It's going to stretch. So it's going to elongate. Um, so if it was possible, you would go in, calculate that amount of axial elongation, and just go in and you'd measure. All right, well, it started out so long and now it's a different length uh, that corresponds to that amount of axial force in the bolt. Um, you'd probably use a, a micrometer, not a caliper. But um, the problem with that is very rarely can you actually go in and measure the length of the bolt. It is possible, in, like this one we could. Um, so there are situations where it is possible to do that, but it is um, often the case that you can't. Sometimes you have blind holes, so there's not a nut at all. It's just a, a bolt that goes down into a hole with threads in the hole and you can't even see the bottom of the bolt. Other times it's that the other side is inaccessible. You can't get to it or whatever. Um, so measuring direct measurement of the elongation is usually not something you're going to have an option to do. Um, so that's, that's um, just the way it is a lot of times. Um, but that is the most accurate way to figure out um, how much uh, preload you have in the bolt itself. Another way, the l probably, well, the, I guess the very worst is just to, to tighten it up and think that's good enough. So you didn't have any ideas, just it's tight now. Um, so that's uh, probably at the very bottom of your list of things you want to do. There are some bolts, uh, this is not one, um, 
but there are some bolts that have an indicator in the head. Um, so a, a hex bolt with a, a viewing window in the head of the bolt that actually will change color. It'll have a, a red dot or, or some colored dot that uh, appears and disappears whenever there's preload or not, it, the sufficient preload or not in that bolt. Um, so those are kind of specialized fasteners for um, not super critical, uh, but important. Like you want to make sure visually, you want to be able to go in and make sure the bolts are all still uh, maintaining their uh, whatever it is they're clamping together. Um, another not great way, but a, a very common way is you get get a torque wrench. So I got a, I don't even know it's going to go in all the picture, but some, this is a larger torque wrench. Um, but they make torque wrenches where you this one you set um, how much torque you want to establish in the bolt. And what this one will do is, you, know, you can turn it to set different amounts. Uh, it's going to click whenever you get to the right amount. Well, you're using this to uh, tighten the nut or whatever you're doing. Um, and it will click telling you that you've achieved that or somewhere near that amount of torque. Um, the problem with these is... Uh, they're really easy to cheat, so if you're, you're not careful and apply the torque to the torque wrench evenly, then you can very easily um, uh, under torque something. Um, obviously, you can over torque; you can just keep keep torquing on it. Um, and so they're not super accurate. There are other styles like this. This is uh, one of the clicking styles. There's some that just have a a needle that you kind of measure with. Um, so that's one way. What we're going to look at is um, what's called turn of the nut. So basically the idea with that is it goes back to the axial deformation. So you can imagine that if you know the um, lead, so remember the lead and the pitch has to do with the uh, spacing of the threads on the uh, screw or nut bolt. Um, if you know that, so how far are these spaced apart, um, then you, you should know that as, every time I turn the nut, I have moved that nut a certain distance. Um, so in that case, if you do, then you could also make the assumption that, well, if I move the nut a certain distance I must, uh, and it's clamped together, then I should be able to calculate how much I actually stretched the bolt. So the idea here is that you, uh, you tighten up the the nut and then uh, based on your calculations you turn it or tighten it so much so many more degrees like a quarter turn past snug or half turn past snug or whatever it'll be that'll be how it's designated um, and that will establish that preload in there so that's somewhere in between um, obviously the most accurate being just direct measurement um, one of the least lesser accurate methods with the torque wrench or just hand tightening it and thinking it's good um, so it's somewhere in between there. Um, now, it's a, there's a little bit of difficulty. You don't just, as you tighten this nut, you're not just elongating the bolt. You are also compressing whatever is in the grip. So uh, you do have to take both of those into account when you go in and try to figure out uh, what this delta total really needs to be. Because um, every time you compress the members in the grip, you've actually released some of the axial deformation on the bolt. So the total, delta total, that you're trying to achieve is whatever change in length of the bolt you want. So that change in length corresponds to how much preload you have. But establishing that also compresses, so this is a plus, also compresses the um, clamped material, the material in the grip. So you have to take that into account. So every time, let me finish writing this, material in grip. So every time that you link, uh, compress the uh, material, it's getting shorter, which actually undoes some of your elongation on the bolt. And so uh, you have to add these two terms together that these are my deltas, Greek letter delta. So this is change in length. So, so elongation total is actually gonna be the amount of elongation you want in the bolt to generate the preload, plus the fact that as you're generating that preload, you're actually squeezing together the clamped material. So you have to 
overcome that also. So you have to add these two together. Um, so things that you need to be able to calculate these elongations are those member stiffness and bolt stiffness. So KB and KM, we did those last time. KB was a relatively simple equation that had the areas and the, um, the you know, the force and that sort of thing. And we came up with some uh, number like 20, uh, mega pounds per inch, you know, something like that. So these were spring rates. Um, so if I know those spring rates and then I know, um, the preload that I want to generate 30 kilonewtons or, well, I guess it wouldn't mix newtons and pounds, but, um, <clears throat> whatever I'm trying to 30,000 pounds with, uh, 20 mega newton per inch spring rate, then I can figure out what that Delta needs to be. So Delta in general is going to be equal to the uh, preload divided by the uh, spring rate. So if you have that force and the spring rate or the members bolt stiffness in this case, you can figure out the uh, delta that you're trying to achieve. You can do a similar thing for the clamp material. Remember we did this uh, um, stiffness for the member, all the stuff in the grip, all the stuff being clamped together. Uh, we went in and did uh, individual pieces. That was that was this stuff um, where we figured out the spring constant for each one of the little pieces, added them all together like springs in series, and then uh, got a member stiffness. You could do the same thing where uh, you want to figure out how much force are you going to generate how much is that going to make this thing squish uh, and then add that to this and then you'll end up with two different deltas um, that's not the turn of the nut though that's how much you want it to squish so once you figure out how much you want it to squish then you can go in and actually figure out well if i want it to um, squish by some total delta let's just put a number here so we have something I have some numbers over here let's see um, 0 0.064 millimeters let's just say that that's how much the total when you when you want to stretch the bolt and the material um, you want it to end up with 0 0.064 millimeters of total squish um, what that means is that you'll need to go in and now you can use that to determine uh, theta so this will be number well let's not say number angle of uh, what do I want to call it angle past snug let's call it that so the You've got the nut snugged up, how much further, so if this is snug, how much further do I want to turn it to actually achieve all of my preload by uh, stretching the bolt a certain amount. So that theta would equal uh, whatever this delta total is divided by the lead. So the lead again is uh, how far does a nut move uh, whenever you turn it one revolution. So it might be, um, so let's just say that this, this was last time a quarter 20. So that was a U.S. number and I've got millimeters over here. Um, so let's not mix those units, but let's say that this is a metric bolt and it has a one and a half millimeter lead uh, in that case. Uh, and remember lead and pitch are not always the same thing uh, pitch is the if you took and measured two adjacent threads it's the distance between those um, lead could be different it could be a multiple like two times the pitch or four times the pitch depending on if there are multiple threads on this bolt uh, all interwoven together most bolts are not going to be multiple starts um, you know, actual fasteners are usually going to be uh, a single start thread. Um, I guess there could be some that are multiple start, but most most fasteners are going to be single start. It's meaning that the lead and pitch are the same thing. So if this was 
uh, our scenario and we wanted to have our total, we worked out our total to be 0 0.064 millimeters of elongation total when you take into account the bolt elongation and the fact that the material itself uh, is going to compress. Then um, the lead in our imaginary bolt here, let's just say our bolt is a, um, oh, I had a number for it here somewhere. Let's see. Um, a 1.5 millimeter lead. So millimeters, or well, 1.5 millimeters per turn. So every time you turn the nut, it would move one and a half millimeters. And then you could figure out uh, that theta would equal 15.4 degrees. And so that would be how the turn of the nut process would work. Um, basically, you're going in and it's figuring out how much you want to stretch the bolt, how much the material is going to compress that you have to additionally stretch the bolt to overcome the fact that the material is stretching or not is compressing. Um, you get that total elongation um, and relate that total elongation to the lead. So the actual size of the or the spacing of the threads on the bolt and you can figure out uh, how many degrees uh, so you might want to go in here. So this is this would actually give you turns, right? Millimeters over millimeters per turn. This would give you turns. So it would actually not give you 15.4 degrees. You would it would give you the number of turns. So it'd be some fraction of a turn to get degrees out of it. Just remember that there are 360 degrees per turn. So that would that would actually get you when you combine this with 360 degrees per turn it would give you how many turns you actually wanted um, or how many degrees you wanted but this would give you turns okay um, so that's establishing the preload there are other things you might want to do that relate to factor of safety and there's three in particular so the other parts of your group uh, other parts of your uh, book give you information about um, here's a diagram of basically the joint we just looked at. Um, here's some of the delta, and there are those um, member uh, forces and bolt forces and member stiffness and bolt stiffness. Um, we talked about this. Uh, they talked about the turn of the net, nut method. Here, this is, so your book goes through two ways to calculate how much torque you're trying to generate in this bolt so that you can actually turn the nut. Um, and one of them, this one, actually begins, this is the exact same equation for an Acme power screw. Um, so there's the secant uh, alpha in there. There's the lead or the friction coefficient. So it goes through, um, it applies a new term here, tangent lambda um that we didn't use when we were doing power screws this tangent lambda is let me show you that show you what lambda is so if you took a bolt and you know it's got threads going around it then if you unwound one of these threads, you know, took and unwound it, you could think of it as, you know, just a, a line. So, like if you're a little person walking up this hill, you feel some kind of incline, right? And that incline is lambda. And tangent of lambda is just this rise over this run and this rise is just the lead right how far did you go up so if you're walking around here you went up the lead um, so rise is lead and this run how far it took you to get all the way around to the same point on the next thread so this is a single start he walks around he comes back around to here um, that run would just be basically the diam uh, the circumference, right? So pi 
times. Now we're not going to use the diameter because there's three different diameters that we might want to use. So we're going to use that mean diameter. Um, in the case of fasteners, we actually use one called pitch diameter. So it might be DP. Um, and so tangent of lambda is lead over pi dp or dm. So that's um, what this new term tangent lambda is. Um, and so you can just calculate it directly. Um, you don't have to go find lambda and then calculate the tangent of lambda. You can just use lead over pi dm for that. Um, and so your book goes through this process of figuring out uh, how to relate the equations that we had for the power screws into a threaded fastener, so a bolt. Um, it does some of the same type of things where it does the uh, washer face diameter uh, one and a half D, that was uh, the same assumption we made when we were uh, clamping things together last time. Um, the collar diameter, now the collar here um, is the nut usually is what you're thinking of as the collar. Um, and so there is a friction between the, the nut having to turn. So you're, you're, this is calculating torque, how much torque you want to apply. Say you want to use the torque wrench or whatever. Um, then you need to know how much torque you need to generate. And so that uh, overcoming that friction from the having to turn the nut on the clamped material or on the washer or whatever it is, there's still friction there. Um, uh, the collar diameter here is referring to the collar diameter of the nut. Remember, it's not the outer diameter. And so in fact, they give you a little equation here. It's that uh, mean collar diameter, average collar diameter. Um, so they come up with an equation that looks very similar to our equation from uh, lead screws and power screws. Um, and so this will calculate torque for you. Here they've um, rewritten it. They also have taken another approach and said all of this stuff is, can, is very similar most of the time. And we're going to lump all of this together into this term K, the torque coefficient. Um, and we can get an approximation. Now they put equals here, um, but it's more an approximation. I guess they're all approximations because you're having to put these friction coefficients in here, which are approximations to begin with, um, or at least they're very difficult to actually determine. Um, you do have to think, keep that in mind. All of these things do rely on some amount of friction uh, calculations when you're dealing with this torque on tightening the nut. And so that's going to make these... Uh, susceptible to being off by some amount. Um, so this equation, 827, is a very simplified version of this equation C over here. So if you want to try and be more accurate, uh, you can use equation C and calculate the torque that you need to develop to develop a certain amount of preload. There's Fi, that's the preload that you're trying to develop. Um, or if you just want a rough approximation, you can take this and put a value in for K. Um, now they have a chart that has a whole bunch of different values that you might put in for K. Um, and it depends on you know what kind of bolt. Is it lubricated? Is it a zinc plated bolt? You know, all these different, uh, does it have anti-seize on it? What, what all different scenarios might you be dealing with? Um, one thing to note here is that it does lump together uh, when you'd use the K, it does lump together the friction on the threads and the friction on the collar, the washer for the nut, um, into one type of idea. So you only have K one time in here. So if you think you have very different friction coefficients, um, then you might not want to use the simplified version here because you only get one value in there. Um, a generic value, if you don't have a specific one to start with on the in the table here is just 0.2 so that's a relatively average friction coefficient uh, in this case it's the torque coefficient um, but here are some specific ones for that that are have been experimentally uh, i'm going to say determined i don't know if determined is the best word for that but experimentally uh, established
Um, so that would be one way that you could go, two different ways actually. One with the very simple equation 827, one with the little bit more going on here in equation. It's just, it doesn't have its own number, it's C uh, built into some other sections in the chapter. They're, they're really deriving this to get to equation 827, but um, you could use this one if you wanted to get a little more details. Um, here are three different factors of safety that you might uh, run into when you're dealing with bolted fasteners. Um, one of them is this NP. So this is basically referring to the factor of safety against the proof strength of the bolt. And so this one is going to be, remember way early on, we said that we were going to either go really close to the proof strength you know you're either going to go 90 percent if we if it was a permanent connection or 75 percent if we were uh, a reusable fastener um, and so you can kind of expect this np to be a pretty low number usually um, it still needs to be greater than one unity um, but uh, it's not going to be much larger than one this load factor um, also includes the idea that um, we're going to have the um, external load is going to be taken uh, by the member first. So the releasing the compression in the member is going to uh, take some of the external load. And so this is usually going to be a larger number than, uh, well, here's the actual equation for it. Uh, this is kind of deriving it. So here's the actual equation for it. Um, and you can kind of see they look very similar. Um, you have the proof strength times the tensile area of the bolt in both of them. Um, here you have the preload in the denominator as an addition. Here you have the preload subtracted off of the top. Um, and then CP is, C is the um, portion of the external load that's carried by the bolt. So this is the uh, portion, portion of the external load in the bolt in the denominator on both of these. Um, and so this one's usually gonna be a larger, much larger number than the one that you're comparing to the uh, strength of the bolt. And then this one is um, how much factor safety you have against joint separation. So again, on our, on our chart here, whenever you have joint separation, you've actually applied enough external load to exceed the preload, the member uh, the compressed members aren't carrying any more force. They've separated. They're not touching one another, so they're not clamped together at all. Um, and the bolt starts taking on all of the uh, external load. You generally don't want this to happen. Um, and so you want to have a factor of safety against joint separation. And that's what this uh, is showing you down here. So you can kind of see Fi is the preload, P is the external load, 1 minus C um, is the amount of the preload that's carried by the compression of the clamp members. And so these three factors of safety, most of these are actually all very straightforward and easy to solve for. You go find your preload, um, you, you look up the proof strength and the um, tensile area of a bolt particular to whatever bolt material you have uh, uh, assigned. Um, you do have to calculate the joint stiffness constant, so that's what we did last time. Um, and you have to have some idea of what the external load is, P. Uh, but all of these, that's all they need in there. So all three of these can be calculated uh, very easily uh, once you know uh, the characteristics of the stiffness of the joint. Um, let's see what I have over here. Oh, this is just the a page where you can find the reference, so 831 and 832 are calculating that preload. So there's the 75% for uh, you're going to reuse the fastener, and there's the 90% for permanent, or at least you're not going to reuse the fastener if you do take it apart. So they've, they've gotten too close to the yielding of the bolt. Um, what I wanted to do next was I wanted to go in to SolidWorks and show you how you might go and simulate this. So this um, idea here is uh, basically, if we go back and look 
in Moodle, we have this um, bolted flange joint problem. This, this one is worked out in detail on YouTube, so you can go and watch this one. Um, some of those numbers I pulled from the uh, turn of the nut and that, they came from this. There's, there's that uh, M10 by 1.5. There was the 1.5 lead or pitch on the uh, bolt. Um, and so you can go and look at this as uh, if you want to see exactly where all the numbers go, this diagram, this problem will go through that. Um, so I've built it again in SolidWorks. So here's the top piece, bottom piece, and I assembled them together. Um, let's say that you actually wanted to run a simulation in SolidWorks to figure out how much uh, factor of safety you have. This will give you the factor of safety against the proof strength of the bolt. Um, so all I did is I built the two parts. These are two separate parts. So there's one part on top, one part on bottom. Um, you don't actually go in and build the bolts themselves. I guess you could and then hide them later. Um, what we're going to do is we're in simulation. We're going to do a new study. Um, we are going to do a static study so that we're not um, you know, trying to fatigue this thing or anything. <clears throat> and then um, it will go ahead and put in some con component contacts there, just basically between the two parts. Um, it did that automatically. You don't have to do anything with that. Uh, what you do need to do is add some connections. So I'm going to right click on connections and you can see there's a bolt connection. So I'm going to add a bolt connection. I'm going to move this out a little bit so you can see. So there are different five different types of bolts um, that it has built in. We're going to use a standard bolt. Um, these others have, you know, the countersunk heads. This is a stud that would be um, fastened down into something and then you put a nut on top of it. So we're just going to use this one. These two um, features that you need to select are basically where does the uh, bolt head go and where does the bolt or, or the nut go. So the bolt head, we'll, we'll have to do this four different times. So here's one bolt head and then we'll put the nut on that line. So the nuts, then the bolt and nut are going to go through that set of holes. Um, Generally, you want the head and nut the same diameter. Um, for us to match up with that problem on YouTube, this is going to be a 16 millimeter head. Um, it does go in and put recommended values um, based on how big you made this hole for the nut to go through and, well, the bolt to go through and the nut to attach to the bolt. Um, but if we look at the actual um, problem statement, uh, that bolt had a 16 millimeter head. You would have to look that up. It, it, it's uh, not part of the problem statement, but based on the fact that it's the M10 by 1.5, you can go look up that they have a 16 millimeter head. Um, we don't need to worry about tight fit. Uh, we can leave the material as just steel. If you had a particular material, then you can put it in here. Um, we do want to go in and add strength data. Um, we're going to go and do a... Um, calculated tensile stress area. So this one was a 10 by 1.5. So that means it has um, not 1.5 threads per millimeter. It actually has the reciprocal of that. 1.5 is the distance between threads. So threads per millimeter would be 0 0.667 if you did the reciprocal of 1.5. Um, bolt strength for that problem was 650 megapascals. So we'll put that in. This safety factor is um, how much do you want to have? How much factor safety do you want to have against the strength of the bolt? We'll leave it at two um, and let it go there. You, this is basically what do you want? Um, the preload is an axial preload for, to match up with the problem. Um, and they determined that you need 28,275, I think. Uh, let me see if that was the right number. Uh, well, I don't see it now. I think that's what it is. Somewhere around there, um, we might get a little bit different number if that's not exactly. It's something like that, though. Um, 28.28 or so kilonewtons. I think it's that. Um, and then we'll click check. 
So what it'll do is now you can see that it has put a bolt and a nut in here. You can actually see it even kind of has the threads protruding past it and it has this axial preload on it. So we need to do that three more times for this to actually work. Um, so right click connections, bolt. We're gonna add the same type of bolt. We'll put one here. We'll put the nut over here. Uh, we'll change the head to 16 millimeters to match the problem. Strength data is going to be 0 0.667 and 650 million. And axial preload, 28,275 newtons. That adds that one. And now we'll add this one. Bolt. Bolt head. Nut face. 16 millimeter head um, strength data is 0 0.667 threads per millimeter 650 million uh, for strength axial preload 28,275 newtons one more Bolt. The head's going to be there. Nut's going to be there. 16 millimeter size. Strength data. Threads per millimeter. It's a proof strength. And axial preload. Okay, so now we have it all bolted together. We need to actually put what force is going to hold this or try to pull this apart. So on the um, bottom here, we're just going to fix this bottom. So fixtures, we're going to fix geometry, and we're just going to fix that bottom surface. So um, in the diagram on the problem statement, it actually has forces pulling on both sides, but when you're doing it, finite element analysis, it's usually best to have some kind of fixed geometry so that things not having to resolve where it actually uh, is going to be in equilibrium. So I just fixed that. That'll be give us the same effect as pulling up with 20,000 here and 20,000 down here. Uh, that's how much force is applied to this thing. So we need to external load a force on this top surface. Now they actually showed up whoops, as compressive. We want to flip those directions. And we want 20,000 newtons is what the problem uh, is using. Oops, oh, change the, oh, cancel. Change the uh, units there. I don't know why I put a one on the end of that. I guess it converted it and converted it back. All right, so now we've got our 20,000 axial. All right, so now we've got um, an external load, some fixed geometry, and four bolts. Um, we need to make sure we have materials defined. Let's see. All right, so I do have materials defined. You can see there's a little green check on my parts over here in the simulation. That means that they have all the information that they need. They're just defined. You can see it here. It's just plain carbon steel is what they're defined as. Um, now we can go to mesh. So right click on mesh, mesh and run. So I'm just going to use the default settings for that. Um, Contact pair is not defined for bolt connectors. Do you wish to continue? Yes. There we go. All right, so here's our very exaggerated uh, von Mises stress. But what we actually want to know is what's going on in the bolts. So we're going to right click on results for bolts. Um, and we want to define a pin bolt check plot. Um, now we can see that the bolts are red. So all the all the flanges and material here, they're all green. The green and red here are indicating uh, uh, they meet our factor of safety. And red means that it does not meet our factor of safety. Remember, we put that we wanted a factor of safety of two on those bolts. Every one of these bolts is coming up red. So that means that they do not have a factor of safety of two. So if I go interrogate one of them, let's find one over here. In fact, you can see, whoop, well, 
factor uh, every time I scroll. <laughs> All right, so the factor calculated factor of safety 1.31565. Um, where we have a desired factor of safety of two. So we do have a factor of safety of greater than one. Remember I said that the, the proof strength factor of safety is going to generally be just barely above one because um, we're running right up to 75% of our proof strength on these bolts. So it's going to be a low factor of safety. Um, but we do have greater than one, so this is typical. And I think the number that the... Uh, uh, problem the by hand problem is very similar this like 1.23 or 1.25 or something like that for the factor of safety on the proof strength for this um, so they do come up with generally the same number um, so that's how if you wanted to test a, a bolted geometry uh, in SOLIDWORKS you could do a simulation relatively easily it wasn't very you know it took us a, I don't know five minutes ten minutes at the most to um, put these bolts in here uh, you can model the bolts, but what you end up doing if you model the bolt as a physical element, it's probably better to go in, hide those models, and use the uh, connections to put bolts that are representative of what you're actually using. So you can define the the bolt size, the uh, you know where they're located. You can define the threads per inch, their individual proof strength, and all that kind of stuff. Um, so. It's usually better to do this kind of bolt uh, versus actually going in and modeling the bolts and putting them in there. I guess that would work, but it wouldn't. Uh, I don't. I don't think I'd do that. So um, that's just another thing you can do uh, if you want to do a simulation with bolts. Uh, once we start uh, making more complicated scenarios, these more or less keep the bolts um, in axial stress. Now, if I go in and Go back to our von Mises. You can actually see that um, the bolts are kind of, you know, they're they're flan uh, splayed out. You can kind of see it on this one right here. It's not vertical anymore, so there is some amount of uh, shear that's wanting to happen in here. There's some bending moment type stuff. Uh, so you do have other factors that are uh, going to affect these bolts also um, when you actually put them into service. Um, obviously, this one's way exaggerated. If we look at a, a true scale, yeah, you know, you can't really see nearly the exaggeration. Maybe you can kind of see, but I'm probably just not lined up straight. Um, so they don't actually deform that much. That's uh, exaggerated, so you can kind of get an idea of what's going on. Um, but that's one another way that you can go about finding out if your bolts are going to uh, have enough factor of safety for your application is to simulate in SOLIDWORKS. Now, remember, don't just take your first simulation as uh, correct. Um, we took all the defaults when we were in meshing. You know, we just did run, mesh and run. Um, we didn't do any, we could show the mesh to see what it actually looks like. So we actually have relatively large elements here. In general, what you want to do is you want to start with relatively large elements, run the simulation, uh, drop the element size down uh, by you know a third or some some you make the elements a bit smaller. Um, run it again, plot some uh, data points of interest, maybe that factor of safety on the bolts or some stress at some location. Um, do that again at least one more time. You know make the elements even smaller. Do it again, um, and you, what you want to see is that either you're getting consistent results they're converging to a solution or um, you know you you want to you want some proof that this model is giving you uh, consistent results you don't necessarily just want to make the elements as small as possible and run that and assume that's right because it, it the, the model itself could have problems so you do want to do some kind of convergence testing to see if you um, consistently get the same results from your model. Um, in this case, you also want to go in and um, do some hand calculations and see did your hand calculations match up what the model is doing. And they did for us. They, they kind of matched up. Um, but you don't want to just take one of these simulations uh, with, with no evidence that what it spit out is accurate or not. So you do want to do something to verify that uh, what the simulation is giving you is uh, consistent with what you think should be happening. Um, you could have easily 
uh, typed one of these numbers wrong on a bolt when we were defining them. We could have put the wrong material properties on something and uh, it not represent what we're actually trying to do. So you do want to verify these results. Okay, next time we'll do a little bit of fatigue loading and that'll probably be our last topic for bolts and fasteners, uh, mm -hmm. bolted connections, mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. Um, but uh, for now, I think we'll call it a day and see you next time. Bye.